Hello and good afternoon, everyone. And I'm going to ask you to imagine that all the trends that we've just been through have manifested themselves. And I want you to all take yourself forward to 2030 and a day in the life in 2030. So by 2030, the 13 years after 2017, humanity's use of technology has changed more than in the entire history of human beings. It's been an incredible time. Not only have Harry and Meghan obviously produced the next heirs to the throne and the next presidents of America by 2030, we've also seen our lives transform. Um, by 2030, I'm still working. I'm still working for Vodafone. I'm married for love, not money, so I'm still wedded to my corporate life. Um, my friends and my colleagues, though, have done rather better than me, and they've managed to emerge and work into the human cloud. They are working on demand when it suits them, um, on every hour when they, when they want to work, or every day, or every week, depending on whether or not they need the income, what their skill is, what the projects are, they're out of interest. So as part of the human cloud, they have flexible and exciting lives. I, on the other hand, um, are enjoying my time with Vodafone. So on this particular day, I, um, I'm actually arriving at a hotel. And in 2030, when I arrive at the hotel, it's a much more perfect and beautiful experience. I don't have to worry about finding my credit card or my ID. I don't have to worry about check-in. I don't have to worry about all the things that cause me stress and friction. As soon as I walk in, my digital assistant has already had a relationship with the digital concierge. She's already made sure that I'm recognized and authorized to be in that hotel. I already know where my hotel room is. Of course, if I want to stop and chat to a human being to find out some personalized, interesting advice or have some human energy, I can do that. And I've got time to do that because my time's not wasted on, on, on silly, pointless, frictionful tasks. Of course, I go straight to my room. My room recognizes me and lets me in based on facial recognition. And when I'm in my room, it's already set to the heating and, and the air conditioning environment that I like, the lighting's to my preference. My digital assistant has sorted this out for me already. I don't have to try and navigate through technology and lighting and heating systems I don't understand. The screens in the room are already playing out relevant news for the day ahead because they've talked to my diary and they know what meetings I've got coming up and they know what my agenda is. So I'm already absorbing content and information that's gonna help me. So again, my day is without friction. Of course, the next day when I wake up, the alarm clock doesn't have to be set. In fact, there isn't an alarm clock. The alarm clock is embedded in every bit of technology in the room. The alarm clock is in the lighting, it's in the heating system, it's in the sound system. So the alarm wakes me up at an appropriate time for the appointment ahead because it knows when I've got to be ready for my meeting. It knows my preference, the amount of time it takes for me to get ready. The alarm also is clever enough to know that when my sleep pattern is at the best time to wake me up, so I'm fully rested. She can detect through my movements, through my eye movements, through my heat temperature, and through my body movement, what my sleep pattern is, and therefore make sure that she doesn't wake me up from deep sleep. So I wake up feeling fully awake and ready for the day ahead. All of this is effortless for me, it's frictionless. It doesn't take any thought, it's just a digital conversation where my preferences have been learned. Of course, all this wonderful connectivity, and by 2030, some of this is actually embedded in me. It's not just sensed around me by the intelligent buildings and the intelligent um, sensors. By 2030, this, this clever technology is also reading every part of my body function. It's looking at my heart rate. It's looking at my exercise level. It's looking at my vitamin mineral levels. It's looking at my weight. Um, it's making sure that I'm actually in the optimal condition to perform the best of human work, to be creative, to be energetic, to be empathetic, to be engaging. This is um, funded by my insurance company and it's funded by my, um, by my Vodafone organization. And it makes sure that medicine by 2030 has moved completely to prevention um, and also detection if necessary. So medicine is completely proactive and completely preventative. I have a digital twin who makes sure that every part of my body is performing optimally. Of course, in 2017, we talked about digital twins being on, on really high-end technology like cars and aeroplanes, where the connectivity and, and the, um, the networks and the, the mobile technology was affordable. But by 2030, every single item that was electronic had become cognitive. That meant that everything that I wanted to use 
was able to be proactively maintained and managed. It was able to be um, monitored. It was able to be available to me. It was also able to understand how I might use it and when I might use it, which meant that it could be personalized to me and also perform to its optimum. Of course, by 2030, I have a lifelong digital assistant, and she's learned all of my preferences. She learned, she's learned what I tend to do at weekends and what I like to do at weekdays. She's learned when I'm at my best to perform, when the best meeting times are. She's learned how I like to read messages and what information I like to consume and when I like to get my exercise. And she sets the schedule accordingly. Um, most organizations by 2030 have stopped thinking about the customer doing the work. They've moved well beyond a self-service app where the customer has to go to the organization, think about what they want, and navigate through a load of menus. By 2030, all organizations are proactive. They're reaching out to customers to say, I think you need my service, or I think you need some help, or I think you'd like to buy some more. They're doing that proactively. They're doing that in a highly personalized way. In 2017, we'd got used to our cars being able to call emergency services if we had an accident. But by 2030, every organization could support our needs proactively. Of course, the keyboard is dead by 2030. In fact, Amazon Handmade is already upcycling them to be desktop curiosities for the next generation. Speech was the main interface by 2030. If I didn't want to use speech, I could use eye gaze control or gesture control. And of course, Vodafone by 2030 is already starting to experiment quite heavily with neuroscience implants. So I can just use um, the technology embedded in my body to communicate. My husband would be delighted to know that when I go home this weekend, my fridge has already anticipated that I'm going to have developed a taste for some American food and would have pre-ordered it. Of course, my fridge, unfortunately, would have had a chat with my digital doctor and decided that I need some good minerals and some um, vitamin levels after having had um, too much good food in New York. So I'll have a nice order of fresh food delivered to it for me and waiting. My fridge would have also worked out that my mum's coming to stay with her rather large St. Bernard dog and therefore we'll need some um, special food made available for them and their needs. Again, I don't have to think about it. It's all made available for me. So I can focus on being at home with my family and welcoming my guests. The drone technology by 2030 had advanced to be a wonderful personalized magic carpet. Thanks to good lobbying in 2017, Drones were completely safe by 2030. They were pilotless and collisionless. Vodafone had worked out very quickly that human pilots weren't very good at using drones. It was far better to let the technology do the navigation. Vodafone had invented geocaching technology to make sure these, these drones didn't end up in the wrong place, and therefore the fear factor had been completely removed. But what these drones really meant is that everything I ever need could be delivered in an hour. It could be anticipated, and then it could be available to me. So the trends that we'd seen in 2017, where we were sharing more of our experiences than our things, or where we were more interested in buying experiences and things, by 2030 had become completely manifest, because we didn't really need to own anything anymore by 2030. By 2030, anything I wanted could be delivered in an hour, and I didn't have to own it and keep it. I could just give it back and let someone else use it when they needed it. And this had even included clothes. So by 2030, my digital dresser would talk to my digital um, doctor to look at my body shape. It would look at what I'd been looking at in terms of fashion and trends, look at the climates I was going to, and make sure that clothing I might need for my upcoming trip was delivered to my hotel as soon as I arrived. And as soon as I was finished with that clothing for that trip, I could return it using that drone, and it would be used by someone else. Again, it meant we were moving to a society where there was less waste, less asset obsession, a society more, more focused on creativity and experiences. Of course, when, I, when I'm working, I still have to understand my day ahead and my diary ahead. And I do this. My digital assistant brings it up on any screen in any environment. Um, she brings it up using the hologram technology that Vodafone had started to experiment with in 2017. So it's very immersive. It's also contextualized and personalized. I don't have to scrabble around to remember the history of any previous connection or contact or any project. It's all available to me effortlessly if I need to be reminded of the importance of the task or the person that I'm interacting with. On this particular day, I do have to travel to a meeting and then the Hyperloop's not available on the route I'm going on, so I'm gonna to have to use a car. I haven't owned a car for 10 years, I don't need to. In the use, don't own world of 2030, my digital assistant has already booked my car. Um, in fact, if I was at home, I, I, I wouldn't have a driveway or a garage anymore. My home is growing a biomass energy source, which is going back into the grid, and then using blockchain technology to make sure 
that I'm paid by my next door neighbour, who is a bit of a bit of a guzzler of, elect, of, of, of power. My digital assistant's ordered my car, and um, today she's made sure that I've got a work car rather than a sports car. Normally, I like to have a sports car and do my exercise on my way to work in my car. Unfortunately, today I've got to do some meetings. Uh, as I walk up to the car, it recognises me and lets me in. As I sit down, it realises that I'm a bit grumpy, so it lets off a nice little aromatherapy spray just to calm me down and get me ready for the day ahead. I work in the car with my team, again using holograms, um, and completely immersively. I don't have to worry about how that car is going to drive or navigate. It uses 5G technology developed by Vodafone to make sure that it's completely safe. It slipstreams right behind the cars in front to make sure it conserves energy. And even if it can't conserve energy, it's got inductive road charging to keep it recharged. As I'm going along, I have, I, I, either through the spectacles all that I'm wearing or through targeted laser technology, an interactive billboard can send me messages. So Vodafone's a nice, a nice 45-year-old by 2030. The billboard recognises that it's me and sends a message wishing happy birthday to Vodafone. So today I'm actually about to take a new, um, a new donor, uh, a new body part to show to the customer that I'm going to see. By 2030, we're not really worried about donors and donor shortages anymore. Every body part can be printed. Um, with the team that I'm working with in the car, we make some changes to the prototype. And that's not a problem. We just get a new one printed out, my 3D printer at home, and that'll be th flown by drone and delivered to my customer's office before I get there. As I'm working, some messages that have been drafted by my digital assistant overnight, and she's learned how I typically reply, what I say. Most of the messages um, can go back to people, slightly personalized, um, to make sure that I've been super efficient. And she's like, she scans my messages, and, if she, and, and she's created them. And if I make any changes that she thinks might be too aggressive or might land the wrong way on the person I'm communicating with, she suggests some corrections just to make sure that I'm demonstrating the right empathy and the right human connections. By 2030, we have a whole industry creating technology that is empathetic and kind and can interact and help human beings in the best possible way. Whereas in 2017, empathetic robots had started with Pero the Seal and had been used to create human relationships and calm humans. By 2030, that's embedded in every piece of technology that we use. As I'm traveling, I'm being told by my digital assistant that I need to look at my team's sentiment analysis as well. Uh, unlike in 2017, where we had an annual satisfaction survey that was taken over a few weeks of the year, and then we'd look at the results and try and spend a year uh, addressing them. In 2030, every single mood of every single member of my team is fed to me in real time, should I wish it. Their facial recognition, their energy levels, their exercise levels, their health levels, their happiness levels, their tone of voice, that anger, their aggression, it's all aggregated up to tell me what their mood is. And my digital assistant is telling me that these guys are pretty tired. They've been working hard. They've been working long hours. They haven't seen enough of their families. They haven't done enough exercise. I need to give them a break. And if I don't give them a break, they won't be the best they need to be to do the human being work of 2030. So I'm able to say straight away, take some time out, people. As I arrive, I'm still feeling a bit grumpy. Um, and I realized that I need a hug from my daughter. And of course, by 2030, that's going to be a really easy thing to have, even though she lives in India, which by 2030 is the most populous nation on the planet. So she's wearing a haptic suit. It's got beautifully embedded uh, wire throughout it, which means I can reach out and give her a tap on the shoulder. And from thousands of miles away, she can turn around and give me a hug. And that hug means that my clothing tightens around me in all the right places, and it's nearly as good as the real thing. I arrive at the customer's office. Offices is by 2030 are a place where all the creativity happens, all the serendipity, all the human interaction is encouraged. So the workplace is something that we love to go to. They're designed to make that creativity happen. Obviously, the, the office recognizes it as me. It recognizes I need a glass of water and a biscuit before I go to a meeting. So a robot duly arrives and shows me to my meeting. And my prototype is there. And we're able to have a fantastic discussion. So, so everything that I've talked about is just an example of the day ahead. And it's worth reflecting on how in 2030, organizations of 2017 had got there. And many had got there by taking little steps onto a big path. Um, this is a Tom Peters takeoff where little steps can make a big change. And those little steps were many and nuanced for every organization. And every single one of them had made the difference to help organizations be 
the force for good in the societies and the communities and the businesses that they wanted to be. Trust had become everything by 2030. And organisations that survived and thrived by 2030 were the organisations that had built trust into their very DNA. They had built purpose and belief and values into their people and their algorithms. And they had created trust and etiquette with how technology was used, how data was used, how personalisation was used, that meant their brand was seen as an organisation that served human purposes and human good. Organisations that tried to operate behind closed boardroom doors without the right integrity and without the right purpose would no longer survive by 2030. Organisations that were thriving by 2030 had developed in their people a love for lifelong learning. In 2017, we talked about the 100-year life being the expectation for our children. By 2030, the 100-year career was starting to be the expectation. And we knew that for our people and for our societies to thrive, they would have to continuously learn new tools because in every moment, technology would be taking over the, the standardised, the dangerous, the repetitive tasks. So organisations that were thriving were helping their people to rethink their careers, rethink their way of learning. They were giving them learning and development and training as a, as a right every day and as a gift every day. So a love of lifelong learning was embedded in the most successful cultures. It was no longer a graduation day and a vertical climb through a single career. Organisations that were succeeding by 2030 had also developed a culture of real-time feedback, a culture where everyone knew where they stood, where the collaboration and agile thinking was the norm, where organisations could collaborate and make sure that they were never in an echo chamber, where they just heard and saw the same ideas and were in danger of standing still. So they could create and they could move at a speed that allowed them to adapt for the technology that was available and to harness it. By 2030, every organisation knew that it would only survive if it had diverse teams, and organ the best organisations were creating diversity in their workforce to enable those ideas, a trend that had started much, much earlier. But by 2030, the only organisations that were successful were the ones that had diversity of thought. These organisations could survive the most turbulent times that were now going to be the norm. Um, I just want to bring you back to 2017 again and just give two small examples that I'm really proud of, that I think are examples of, of little big things that Vodafone's doing that represent diversity, creativity, foolishness, all the things that we need to embark on in the, in the decade ahead. Um, the first one is Dream Lab. Um, and this is a story of, of a brave, very brave and tenacious young girl in Australia who, um, who decided that um, when our phones are um, not being used by us, they're wasted computing power. And if we could make that computing power available, then we could form a supercomputer. And the big problem with solving big problems is it takes a lot of computing power. It takes, and the, the computers that need to look at big data, at the volume, um, are not easily available. And they're particularly not easily available um, for some less commercial or more ambitious targets. So she worked out that if, if she could create an application that allowed you to give permission to your mobile phone, to be used when you're not using it and it's on charge, all that mobile phone computing power could create a supercomputer. So she, we, she developed this and launched this through the Vodafone Foundation in Australia. Um, but she wasn't, that wasn't enough for her because we couldn't get permission from Apple, um, for Apple to do this and make this app available. And she lobbied and lobbied and lobbied and went right to the top of Vodafone and made sure um, that our Vodafone CEO, Vittorio, then went right to the top of Apple and persuaded Apple that this was an application that would be a force for good. And as a result now, in a number of countries around the world, it's just been released in the UK. Um, you can opt into this application, you can download it from the App Store, and you can then make sure that when your phone isn't being used by you, its computing power forms part of this massive computer. And that massive computer is being used to do DNA analysis and look for the patterns in DNA that will ultimately help us detect um, and ultimately solve the riddle behind cancer. So it's an incredible innovation. Um, it's an incredible piece of ambition, an incredible piece of tenacity. Um, I'm really, really proud of it. Um, the second one, which is slightly different, is, um, again, a story of tenacity and foolishness, but perhaps for a different aim. And this is, this is putting 4G on the moon. Um, obviously, there's not a lot of really good paying customers on the moon. 
Um, so it's not, not the best business case. Um, so when the team decided that they wanted to do this, and, and this started off in, in our German organization, it was rejected as a really bad idea and no business case. And the reason why we were being asked to do it was because there's a, there's a mission to the moon in 2018. And where they land is going to be a safe plan place, unlike some of the initial um, moon landings. But where they want to go um, is, is a long way apart. And where they land has got a nice satellite signal that can connect back to Earth, but where they want to go has got no satellite signal. So they needed to build a 4G network on the moon to make that connectivity. So they came to us and said, well, will you build it? Um, and again, through some, some significant, tenacious pursuit um, of our technology teams, we eventually said yes. Um, but it's, it's kind of a foolish project, really, because there's not a lot of money behind it. Um, and one clue to that is the project is with a team called PTS, um, and PTS stands for part-time scientists, um, so, which doesn't strike you as the most professional outfit. Um, but also, the, obviously, the physics on the moon is a little bit different. So the LTE spectrum where you, we're building and creating doesn't exist. It doesn't exist on Earth. Um, so we've had to go to our colleagues in Hawaii and ask them if they can create a, a four routers for us um, that operate on this LTE spectrum that's going to work in the moon. And they're, they're sort of knocking that up in their shed um, in Shanghai for us as well. On, as, and, and we're also hitching a ride up there on um, SpaceX as well. That probably won't get there. Um, so the, the whole thing is experimental, it's foolish, it's innovative, it's ambitious, it's fun, it's engaging. And it kind of is, is really what the, the, type, the era ahead is about. It's about letting the humans do that, letting us have some fun and be experimental and be engaging. Um, giving permission to do things that might fail and learning as we go there. And sometimes starting out without an obvious end in mind, because the journey can create the end. The journey can create the culture or the belief or the values that we want to embody in our organizations. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.